Shut up and sit down. Howdy and salutations, welcome to Broken Table Commentary, a three-man creative debate podcast all about the greatest of fake sports, professional wrestling. Every week, we each bring a different topic to the table. The topics can be sick and ridiculous or serious, opinion or factual, creative or not, whatever we feel like. And as always, the topics is this week are in the description. On commentary, we have Mark, the Divinary Diabetic Dad, Linton. <laughs> Our historian, my sicky Scottish baby boy, Michael. I am Michael, held together this week by Iron Brew and Briffin. And our critic, me, Jessel. You can follow us on SoundCloud, YouTube, Facebook, at BrokenTableCommentary.com, or directly at BrokenTableCommentary.com, and as requested episodes are downloadable on SoundCloud as well. New episodes are broadcast every Thursday, Eastern. Oh, damn, I, I lost it. Oh, you I, was trying so to, I was trying to be a Micro Machine Man. Uh, new episodes broadcast every Thursday, 7 p.m., Eastern Standard Time. Check us out on Broken Table Commentary everywhere. This is episode number 14, Grandma's Nesting Tables. That's right, it's ladies. <laughs> That's right, it's ladies' night, as we three men are going to tell you all about women in wrestling. <laughs> we had a women's money in the bank, we have Glow on Netflix uh, debuting on Friday, and we're having our second ever Hall of Fame round, uh, wink wink, it's about the ladies. Before we get any farther though, hashtag who got Enzo, we got the big reveal on Raw on who got Enzo. We did. And it was Cass all along, it was Cass. Cass punched Enzo twice, then he uh, faked it and tried to blame Enzo by holding Enzo's necklace, and Enzo was like, God, that's weird, I didn't do that. And then when Big Show teamed with him, he tried to pretend the Big Show hit him, uh, but it all came out. And then, uh, uh, it was actually, a, like, an incredible segment. It was so cool to see this storyline be the main event of Raw. I think that was really cool. Yeah, um, once once they uh, put Samoa Joe and Roman Reigns at the 10 o'clock hour, I was like, oh my god, who got Enzo is going to be in the main event? I'm so excited! And it definitely did not disappoint. That tear running down uh, Enzo's oh, it, cheek. Yeah, the legit acting from Enzo was wonderful. But I wanted to share a thing that I got from a uh, from a listener. He sugge- He really wanted to see a scenario with now that Big Cass has turned on Enzo, he wants next week... Uh, or very soon, Enzo and Big Show to team up against uh, and have a tag match for the titles against Sheamus and Cesaro and win it just immediately on Raw in a shock. That way, it really proves that Cass is wrong here in his heel turn because his big thing is, I never had championship gold in the WWE and it's because of you, Enzo. Uh, You know something, Jesso? I think we have to call you out here. I mean... You don't have to be Columbo to have worked out the clues here when you gave away the women's match result from Money in the Bank last week on this podcast when Baron Corbin won a main event in Money in the Bank in which Nakamura was written out of 90% of the match and most glaringly of all, when the Ascension got a pay-per-view match, admit it, you're the booker man. (laughs) <laughs> I had a historically good prediction night at Money in the Bank. I did pretty damn well for myself. And you got BTFI points, but you haven't gotten any of those in a long time. <laughs> no, I, on- <laughs> I only got it for WrestleMania, and then I got nothing else. Till till uh, Sunday. Money in the Bank was quite controversial because I was right, and the way that uh, Carmella won was uh, was by James Ellsworth taking advantage, climbing up the ladder, getting the briefcase down and tossing it to her. The only thing I got wrong about my whole prediction of that happening was they did it in the ring so it was all on camera instead of her being on the outside, which would have required a second camera. So, you know, that's just logistics. Well, I don't think that's true. I think it makes her look like she was actually a legitimate, legitimately part of the uh, whole moment because she was actually at least close to the Money in the Bank briefcase. I mean, she I was right there you. at the end of it. She wasn't just... I don't think it was just logistics of the camera. I agree with you. I think it I think it helped make her look strong and good for it because even though he did climb up it and get it, no one else was in that ring at, at all. Car if James Ellsworth has just waited, she would have still been the one to climb up and get there because everyone was too injured on the outside. That that for the first ever women's money in the bank, that was a quite controversial choice to have a male 
go up the ladder and get the briefcase. I clearly didn't have a problem with it because I I, uh, thought it would happen. But I do have a problem with what they did on SmackDown. SmackDown, they spent the whole episode with everybody weighing in on whether it was a good decision or a bad decision to have James Ellsworth do that. Uh, It opened with an incredible promo from uh, um, Carmella. Uh, who just she she did awesome. She got so yeah. much heat. It was she was the star of I that promo. She, I didn't know she had that in her. That was an amazing promo. Yeah, it was awesome, and it, she just proved. Look, I was gonna win anyway, and there's nothing against the rules. No one cheated. I won legit, and that was it's wonderful. It was a great promo. And then they spent the whole episode with everybody coming and complaining to Daniel Bryan that everything went wrong. Now, when you have a controversial finish in the WWE, there's two ways you can go about it. One, you can make it just be fine, like uh, The Rock Big Show, Royal Rumble 2000. That's just what happened. Or, you can make it look like, hey, we did make a mistake, let's fix it. If you make it be fine, then it's fine. But as soon as you actually, in kayfabe and in story, say, no, this was a huge mistake, we need to fix it, any goodwill that happened from from the uh, Money in the Bank match, the first one with James Ellsworth getting it, any of the goodwill, any of the heat, uh, any of the controversy, controversy, any yeah. of the uh, uh, any of that is immediately put in the light of this was a huge mistake. And that's I. That's a huge problem. Lots of people did not like that a male got the briefcase in the first women's one. I get it. I totally understand where people are coming from with it. Uh, some people were actively, like, super pissed. But to have the match reversed and the briefcase taken from her is doubling down on the proof that that was a terrible thing to do. Which is the wrong way to go about this. It's what it, it legitimately just makes Carmella look bad after she gave such a great promo to reverse it and have a new money in the bank next week on smackdown is it it's terrible it's just an awful idea Uh, i was talking to my wife just before we recorded it's like taking uh it's it's like they wanted to um have their cake and eat it too with having the controversial finish and now they can have the real finish but they did it in the wrong order it's not like when Chris Jericho got the phantom title win, or Owen Hart got the phantom title win. Those were baby faces who got phantom wins so the crowd can have a people's champ, but then the heels reverse it. This is a heel did nothing wrong and is punished. That's, that is, instead of have your cake and eat it too, that is shit all over the ring and smear it around. I, uh, well, first I'll talk about Money in the Bank and the actual match itself. I think that people, um, I, I have a hard time relating to people who get mad about wrestling. That's one of my, uh, I guess that's why I get called the mark. Um, so when Jessel says he understands why people would get angry, I watched the pay-per-view with two people who got angry at the finish, and I couldn't, I, I can't really relate to that. The important thing and the reason why it's historical that it happened is that WWE trusted that the fans would be interested enough in a women's Money in the Bank match, and that WWE trusted that the women could pull off a Money in the Bank match with people being uh, not hurt. The finish of the match is is fake wrestling, and it's about setting up the storyline, and that's what wrestling has always been. It, it It's TV. So the, pe- the fact that people are upset about a man winning in a storyline of fake wrestling or hitting the briefcase down is not what's important to the fact that there's a first ever women's money in the bank match. And that's just that's just a reminder for the people that are upset. All the the, the big accomplishment was still was it still happened. And that's something to remember. Uh, I definitely agree that taking um, the thing away from her hurts her heel heat. Not to the extreme that Jess was going here because it is a storyline and this thing has to play out. And we have another Money in the Bank match next week. And if Carmella comes in next week and her and James Ellsworth find another way to screw over the Money in the Bank match next week and get her the briefcase again, adding that to what happened this past Sunday, I I think it's going to be incredible if that's the route they go. Um and that having the whole thing with Daniel Bryan absolutely works. 
and that having him rip the briefcase off of her because we never have had somebody climb up there and take it down that wasn't in the match. So he is. this was the chance to establish what the rule should be. So I, I'm perfectly fine with all of that. I think we... I think uh, to say that it's like shitting in the ring is a little bit jumping the gun. I understand that if if next week Carmella is has nothing to do with the finish and she goes back to doing what she did, then absolutely 100%. That was such a waste of time because that heel heat that she got at the beginning of SmackDown was amazing. But if she is involved in that finish, even if she doesn't win, but she gets even more heel heat by trying to do something super douchey and cheaty, I think that it all works out. So I say definitely give this another week. And uh, see what happens before we uh, cut it down too bad. That's where I stand. No, well said. You 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 said you said my thoughts better without all my dumb emotion about it. But you know, I WWE has done this enough times, and they have failed us enough times to where I can understand the anger. So I'm not trying to cut your anger down. No, I'm just no, saying, no. yeah. So I, I I wouldn't be surprised if next week. Honestly, my prediction after the thing I saw from Becky on SmackDown, my prediction is I think Becky is going to win the Money in the Bank briefcase next week. I and I think Carmella and James are going to try to do something, but I don't think that Carmella is going to win it again. But if they do and they go that route, which I wouldn't be surprised if they go that route, that's just not my prediction. Uh, I think I mean it will be fantastic. I mean they 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 can't have not heard how over in heel heat she was just flooded with and how great she did and lately they've been really good about seeing that and catching that and pushing those people that are getting great heel heat i mean they're putting elias samson in a feud with finn balor and he's getting crazy heel heat from tuning his guitar so and alexa bliss is like the biggest thing on raw right now as a heel um uh, other than that i've heard a lot of people say this was a pretty crappy pay-per-view but for me i thought it was great i thought the tag match was great I thought that Lana actually looked pretty good. I mean, she was it wasn't a phenomenal match, but it was it was a good match. Uh, it was perfectly fine. Uh, I loved Jinder uh, Randy Orton. That was so stiff and hard working. It had had a better story than the last one, though it had a similar finish. Um, potentially leading up to the rumor is a Punjabi prison match for the third one. The return of the Punjabi prison. That's amazing. Like uh, I'm, I'm, I'm stoked. Uh, I'm not. I wasn't a big fan of the main event uh, men's Money in the Bank match, but that's because it was a little spotty for me. I prefer the stories. So the best stories that happened were the opening where Baron beats up Shinsuke, the Shinsuke AJ finally looking at each other moment, and then the way it finished. Like that was, you know, that's really the only stories that were there. There were some big spots, but spots have never been the thing I liked about these matches. I know that's what a lot of people like, but... It wasn't a very good show, to be honest. I didn't think so. No. And, of course, I was ill, and I stayed up to 4 a.m. to watch it because I'm a stupid addict to WWE who (sighs) watches all this rubbish, hoping for the great pay-per-views. But, um, God, that, that, that sounded more jaded than I intended. Uh, I, I've actually been. I, I watched Raw. I was just watch, rewatching Raw this morning, and I thought it was actually really good. Surprise, you know, for the thing we. But uh, yeah, the the pay per view, um, the women's stuff was that. It was quite good until I think we jiggy. Um, the tag match was all right. That's a tag title match. The other tag match for the Ascension was bloody pointless. The gender match was... I don't think Orton meshes with, with him, which is my wow. chance. My chance. Yeah, that, that's Jeez. so crazy to me. Uh, yeah. Mostly, I, 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 I'm actually thinking, what have those poor boys done to Randy Orton? He's, he, he's trying to murder them on pay-per-view. You know, the, the Singh brothers. They're dropping them with their head everywhere. I don't know. That's so weird. Did you did you like Gender Orton? Lenny? I am in love with the Gender Orton. All right. Feud so personally. at least you and me, <laughs> at least you and me are loving it. Because I've heard so many people hate it, and I, I and Michael didn't like it, but I lo- I'm loving it. I want to see that baby boy go to SummerSlam. So I, I really want to see hope him does. go to WrestleMania. <laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, I suppose it would be uh, remiss of me not to mention. Uh, Mr. Perfect's son getting a minor push on Raw. Hey, oh, yeah. Entourage. And it, 
it, le- it led into my commentary line of the week, which I hope could be a returning thing in this podcast this week. Michael Cole, the Bears are assaulting Ambrose. <laughs> 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 but funnily enough, as much as I hate JBL, he had my commentary line of the week this week because of Mike and Maria uh, Canales' uh, debut with their amazing song. Oh, my god! And after the debut, they just cut to the commentary table and you just see a, a beaten down JBL just look down and say, he took her name. <laughs> and that's it. He just can't believe that a man would love a woman so much that he'd take her name. That's funny. I missed that line. That's great. One. This is a very simple one, which is create a new battle royal type match. And I said, be as creative as you want. And because I'm going to have to take 10 minutes out of my voice, I'm going to very quickly go through my rubbish idea first before I hand over to uh, Lenny and Justin. Um, Unfortunately, my great ideas... I, I, I blew them earlier in this podcast. For example, Battle Royals on a boat and the, the legendary Rumble in a Cell match. Rumble in a Cell, baby. Oh, yeah. Battle on a boat. So I, I was trying to, I thought, what could I possibly come up with? Um, and then I had the issue when I had come up with it. I thought, oh, my God, have TNA done this? But no, they did something similar, but not quite. And, of course, they TNA'd the whole thing up. Mm. So, what I have is the Royal Rumble Money in the Bank match. You see, two men start. There are 20 men in all. Every 90 seconds, another man enters the match. Elimination by going over the top rope, but all TLC weapons are allowed. When number 20 enters, those who are left can enter the ma- can win the match by climbing up a ladder and retrieving the briefcase but you can still be eliminated by going over the top rope and walking here before, <laughs> until there's only two people left, so we don't have a dusty finish, obviously. Uh, you can also do it with tag teams for titles, but not with the whole, if one guy goes, both of them go, you know. So we could then have a tag, t- a tag title scenario where there's one Hardy boy against both of the, the club and uh, Seamus and Cesaro. Uh, with this combination of Battle Royal and Ladder, it, uh, Rumble and Ladder, it gives you more inroads into long-term storytelling with ladders, which, you know, I also have trouble with ladder matches, because they're all the bloody save in the end. Plus, it's a Battle Royal, and more Battle Royals are always great. That's a pretty cool idea. Alright, see, uh, uh, what I, I don't like Money in the Bank as a concept, in general, so, so you know, I, it, I, I'm already fighting an uphill battle for this one, but I like the idea enough. Well, when I say money in the bank, it could be, it, it, you know, it's, you substitute that for a title, like, you know, uh, give 20 people an IC title showcase at, you know, WrestleMania or something. Yeah, yeah. when you when you mentioned you could do with tag teams, I assumed then that uh, money in the bank, you meant you could do titles too. So that really, I would, I'd rather do it with titles than money in the bank, because I definitely think the uh, money in the bank needs a upgrade or something new added to it. This for titles would be pretty neat, actually. I'm, I'm shrugging. I mean, it doesn't sound bad. I, I just always, I liked ladder matches. There's a simplicity to the ladder match that I, re, that I really like. So this it overcomplicates it for me. But I, it, it wouldn't be, un, I wouldn't dislike watching it. Uh, my Battle Royal slash kind of gauntlet match slash Battle Royals are hard to come up with new things for. Uh, it's the Pick Your Poison Battle Royal. It is a 20-man match. Four men start in the ring, elimination over the top rope. Now, once someone is eliminated, uh, whoever eliminates them gets to pick out of the remaining people who takes their place. So, The Miz eliminates Curtis Axel. Then he looks up at the uh, ramp of all the other people waiting to be entered into the Battle Royal, and he would have to pick. So, he could pick an ally. He could pick someone he has been waiting to get his hands on. He could pick somebody who'd be easy to eliminate. But he has to pick somebody. He has to pick his next poison to take the place and be added to this uh, Battle Royal match. If multiple people eliminate someone, they have to uh, come up with a replacement together. Or the wrestler who's eliminated gets to come back into the match. So that's it. It goes until one person is left standing. I dig it. I like it. 
I, I like the pick your poison conceit to it. I, I've used this in an e-fed before, and it was not an over the top rope. It was pinfall eliminations, and you pick who takes their place. But since I wanted, I really liked the idea, so I changed it a bit to be a uh, yeah the battle I like royal. It. So there's just so many different stories that can be told here. I think with having to pick who the takes pick your the place poison somebody. definitely has great story potential. So. I agree. All right. Well, here's mine. Uh, as normal on these creative ones, I, I went a little overboard. Um, this is a tag team four corner lumberjack battle royal. <laughs> well, say that again. Tag team four, four corner, corner. lumberjack ba- lumberjack battle royal, uh, okay. or what I would call it, the seven point crown. That would be my 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 name for it for the match type. You know, there's not actually like a tag team gimmick match. TLC used to be a tag team gimmick match, but then they just allowed singles pe- singles matches to have it. So there's not a match that's just like tag team specific. There's the tag team version of a ladder match, the tag team version of a steel cage. So I really wanted a tag team battle royal, but I couldn't come up with a way to do it until I came up with all these dumb rules. So here's my rules for the seven point crown. It is a uh, uh, seven to ten tag team match. So you can have seven teams to ten teams in it. Four teams are chosen randomly by drawing, uh, or you do a beat the clock, or some other reason to have the four teams start, each team picking one of their members to be in the ring. Um, All other participants of the match surround the ring lumberjack style. Bell rings, ding ding. Uh, Each team is a unit, gets a point for every elimination they have. Um, uh, Eliminations are not permanent, by the way. Um, So each team as a unit gets a point for every elimination. Um, Whenever a wrestler is eliminated, another wrestler on the outside can enter the ring. Uh, You can enter the match multiple times. Uh, If multiple wrestlers enter simultaneously, to the referee's discretion they stay, uh, with no additions until it gets below four again. So if you toss out Sami Zayn and three other guys all jump in at the same time, then they all enter and no one can jump in again until we are down to, we get down below four. Teams can be disqualified, so there is a referee in the ring and they can toss them, they can toss teams out of the match. Um, uh, Both members of a team can be in the ring at the same time, so it's a huge uh, benefit if you can get both of yourselves in because you, you, uh, you know, you, you want to try to get points. First team that gets seven points, hence seven point crown, wins. Uh, and then the outlaw rule is in effect. So you don't get a point for tossing out your partner or for tossing out yourself. So if you tope suicida or whatever, you don't get a point for that. It's just you eliminated yourself. But the, you might have a reason to do that. You might be taking out like eight guys on one side of the ring so your partner can come in and, and toss the other two guys and get points. It just... I, I think it's a really cool way to get a bunch of neat little story elements. I think it has just enough rules to be interesting without being too many rules to explain. Because um, a lot of the rules you don't have to say out loud. A lot of them can be said over uh, commentary or just understood by watching. But yeah, this is the seven point crown. It's not as complicated as I thought it was going to be with that name. I actually like it. And you bringing up the fact that uh, there's not a tag team gimmick thing. That, that bothered me. I was like... Oh my god, he's right. What the... Uh, I know, right? Heck? It shocked me. It shocked me. Because I then I was like, well, what about tables match? Isn't that... I was like, oh, I guess not. It used to like always be tag teams doing tables matches, but no, that's not really for tag teams. But yeah, you're right. So, I mean, the, the only complaint I have on it all is just <gasps> the, the visual, because you're going to have to have every tag team listed for all the people there, for starters, you'll have to have that on the, the the Titantron and how many points everybody has. And then for watching at home, you either have to have the commentary regularly saying it or you have to have a little ticker going across the bottom constantly. Yeah, I, I, do, a, I, do, a, uh, I do a static ticker at the bottom. Yeah, that would be yeah. a little bit distracting. I but. was uh, uh, watching like uh, NBA with you the other the other week, or watching NFL stuff. People are programmed for sports to do that anyway. Yeah, just to constantly have that there, so it didn't feel like a big deal to me. Wrestling doesn't do it, and there's plenty of room down there because you know they barely nobody flies out of the ring all the time on the bottom. So I, I think it could be done, but no, it's a, it is a good a good criticism. I should take it on the screen anyway when there's an Iron Man match. So yeah, yeah, but it would be. If it, we're talking seven to ten teams, you're running a ticker <laughs> of 
Seven. Uh, the the I I really love the idea of it coming down to the match could come down to two full teams. It could come down to four members of four different uh, four different teams. It could come down to one team working together against two separate guys. It could come. Uh, there's so many little ways it could all come down, and I really really like that. I think another criticism, which mine falls into this too. I think Michaels is the one that uh, actually does avoids falling into this trap which a lot wwe tries not to fall into this trap is that both your and my matches would be hard for casual fans unless you know all the storylines for all 20 of the people in my match it's going to be hard to be invested in who picks what poisons and unless you are really familiar like with all the different tag teams it's going to be hard for people because i mean there are a lot of tag teams that still when they come on the tv my wife's like okay who are they and i'm like oh those are the the colons and that's a uh, Rizongo and stuff. So with yeah. the current tag team situation we have now, 10 of them, I mean, there's going to be for the casual viewer, a lot of those people, they're going to yeah. have a hard time remembering them. Wow. Mm-hmm. It, it was either work really well or be a mess. And there's only one way to find out. So to Ravi, get Jess on the phone. All right, let's move on to uh, topic number two. Two. All right, topic number two is mine, uh, and I'm going to explain this in this in a way for people who aren't super familiar with wrestling terms. My topic is, what are some moments in wrestling that are considered uh, by a lot of fans, doesn't have to be all the fans, but most fans to be real and off script and mistakes and things that break the fabric of the storytelling but that we believe are actually uh, what was supposed to happen and actually did follow the script or at least a lot closer to it than people seem to believe. And this is more of an open discussion than, oh, you have to name three and everybody has to have, follow certain criteria. So it's just talking about things that the wrestling, the wrestling universe believes are uh, the real things that happened that weren't supposed to happen, that we... we believe okay no actually i think you're wrong these are total things this is it's conspiracy theories so yeah wrestling terminology uh um what are things that most people think are shoot but we think are works for all the nerds out there like like me so i and i don't know how many we'll get through because i've got four down but it depends on if people disagree if people agree how much we actually talk about everything uh this one and, was really hard for me. Could you think of any? Uh, I mean, I wrote down a handful, but but for the most part, uh, most of the things that are that are considered shoot that are considered to have actually happened are like confirmed, and that's that's like that's that's what made it hard for me. It was hard to find ones that either were interesting enough to talk about, or were had enough leeway to make them be. Um, potentially be works. It was it was an interesting is interesting interesting uh, topic. Well, I found that in most of the most of the uh, situations by confirmed, there's always at least somebody involved in the situation that says, "No, that's not exactly what's happening." So there's always there's like uh, the one of the ones I have on here. Um, is the uh, Vince Russo promo on Hulk Hogan at Bash at the Beach 2000. Now, this is confirmed by uh, Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff that Vince Russo goes off script and goes out and cuts this huge promo on Hulk Hogan and tells him he'll never work in the company again, and this was not planned for. And uh, Russo just just cuts Hogan down to pieces and tells him that he's been ruining the wrestling business and holding guys back. And it's it's considered by most to have been a uh, a shoot. But Russo has always maintained that it was not and this was known all along and it was part of the plan. Hogan just hated the reaction that the boys in the back gave him after the promo happened and he hated being talked about like that and so Hogan made up the whole thing about it not being planned because he was so upset by it so there's an example of because that's something that I, I always thought was a confirmed thing that everybody involved said oh yeah Russo went off script but then when I looked into it Russo absolutely says that it was uh, the plan so all you're, along. So are you saying that you think it was a work? Yes uh, I uh Reading Russo's thing, watching watching the bash at the beach thing, there are 
several reasons that I believe that it was planned all along and that this is just a case of Hogan hearing those things about himself that Russo's saying in a promo that was planned and then being extremely true and the boys in the back probably saying really shitty things about Hogan while he's backstage and Hogan just flipping out because, I mean, Hogan was a diva. Hogan was incredibly dramatic. I I, I see... feel so weird that I'm defending Hogan and you're and you're on the attack because <laughs> I definitely think this I definitely think this is shoot. I find Bischoff and Hogan to be the most trustworthy sources here. It's very it's very intriguing. I never like it, like if Hogan had showed up again, if something had come of this, then I then I could I could feel you that it was work. But it definitely he was he was stripped of the title and fired. That's what happened. He, he, that was the end of it. There was no storyline progression or anything, which. For if it was a work, it was a terrible work. No, and I'm not saying that. Oh, it that's was true. all terrible. <laughs> we aren't talking about quality. <laughs> it was <laughs> all <that's> true. <laughs> trash. I think. I think the plan all along was to do a because they he wasn't stripped of the title. They were gonna. Russo was making a new title that Jarrett and Booker T were gonna go for. It wasn't. We're taking the belt from Hogan. It was Hogan. You take that belt and you keep that belt. There's gonna be a new belt for uh, Jared and Booker T to compete. Now, that's a setup for a storyline right there. And that, I mean, that is a good storyline if you've got then Booker T winning the belt from Jared and then Hogan comes back later and then you get the two belts. But, I mean, everything went to hell for WCW a little bit while later. Um, the main thing that makes me believe this is all a uh, work is the commentary throughout this pay-per-view. They are... And it's a pretty bad commentary team because Mark Madden is part of it. But they are just everything they say and their reaction to everything is feels so planned and it feels so scripted. Like right after uh, Russo comes out there, they cut to him and uh, – uh, I don't remember who it is. Immediately, it's like this is real fans. This is Boss Russo. This isn't character Russo. And they do that over and over and over. And Mark Man is just sitting there with his mouth gaped open, like, "Oh, I can't believe what's happening!" Throughout the entire thing with Russo. And of course, there's there's plenty of time in the night. There's no overrun. Russo goes out there and cuts like a 20 minute promo, and they add an extra title match that wasn't supposed to be there. And the show still fits all into the time slot. Uh, Russo during this, uh, one of the interviews he's done talks about that, uh, how in the world would the creative director have been able to go out there and destroy the name of the greatest professional wrestler and the guy who is the biggest money draw for their company and not get fired the next day? Why wouldn't Russo have been fired for doing all of that? And that's another really good point. Why wouldn't he have been fired for doing that? Those are, those are good points. You're right. I, I, uh, for one of the ones I have written down, the the WCW commentary team absolutely are the proof for me that it was a uh, work and not a shoot. Uh, um, a lot of people consider William Regal's last match in WCW, where with him versus Goldberg, for Regal to have um, decided to actually wrestling shoot on Goldberg to prove his superiority to no sell a bunch of moves. It's a uh, it was very interesting looking this up and watching the match because the uh, you heard with it you heard about this I know I'm sure I'm sure uh, uh, Michael has oh this <laughs> go ahead Michael oh yeah I've just saying yeah I've heard of it and it, I, I quite like the match actually <laughs> I spent about forty five minutes researching this so I am very interested in what you're going to say because this is this is one that is kind of on my list, so I want to hear what you're yeah, going to say. Yeah, the, the Regal Goldberg, Goldberg thing was interesting. Like, supposedly, Regal was on his way out, and he didn't, and he was upset with Goldberg. He was upset with, with him being pushed to the moon or whatever, uh, uh, his superiority. So he was going to, he was going to work him good. He was going to work stiff and no-sell things and, and, uh, and really put him through the ropes. And if that was true... If that was actual, and not just Regal, even years now, continuing to be an excellent heel and sticking to kayfabe, then there is no way... This would be have been Daniel Pooter versus Kurt Angle. This would have been... They had to do something to keep that from happening. Because Regal could beat Goldberg in a fight, hands down. <laughs> Jericho beat the shit out of Goldberg backstage once. I mean... The, like, uh, uh, well, Jericho's kind of a badass backstage. He, he almost beat the shit out of Brock Lesnar. I was about I mean, to say... 
but but regardless, it's it's uh, um, uh, you would think that if if that's the case, if Regal really was going to show him the ropes, the Regal really would wrestle it around him in circles. But the story of that match and the commentary of that match is that Goldberg is also smart. It's they they start talking about oh he's all power, but whenever Regal put a move on him, Goldberg would reverse it into another move. Like it's just an actual wrestling match that was a little sloppy because Regal was at his most in pain, most out of shape that he was in WCW when he left. Uh, the there's n- the commentary doesn't flub up anything, and this was good WCW commentary at the time too. This was Shivani and and Bobby Heenan. Like this is no Mark Madden doing his garbage this was the good commentary and bobby is notorious for for not holding his cool in the wcw when things go off script but the two of them the, there were no commentary flubs there was a botch here or there from regal and goldberg but all of it just it was just a regular match to me to put over how smart goldberg was so i i think that this is way overblown calling it a shoot i definitely think it went a hundred percent as intended and the story of that match, from what we can, you can see on the screen, is that Regal tries to outsmart Goldberg with every trick from the European school in the book, and Goldberg can still beat him. Yeah, I think for this one to have been a shoot that Regal, that then you you also have to say that Regal really failed. At doing it, because I think, like you said, if Regal wanted to go out there and kick Goldberg's ass, he would have done it, and he and he doesn't do that. So yeah, I agree that that one is definitely blown out of proportion. Uh, now th- I don't have any proof for another one, but uh, just one I wanted to to throw out there as a conspiracy theory: What if the garden incident was a work? Uh, with the uh... with when the click all came to the ring on uh, Nash and Hall's last night broke kayfabe and hugged what if that was a work (laughs) well what do you mean what if it wasn't them breaking kayfabe and them all going out there uh to break characters what if it was i don't know it's all conspiracy nonsense there's no proof of it either way it was just interesting thought process what if this was planned by vince mcmahon from the beginning what if it was a plan by vince to have the click go out there and do that to let the to let the guys leave gorilla cuz vince sits right there he's uh, right he he is he is well he's not sitting there at that point i think he was on commentary at that point no it was at the garden so it was uh, Hash- well regardless there are people who would not have let them go out of gorilla but they did they were able to leave gorilla and go and all hug in the middle of the city what if vince heard rumblings of the nwo thing and he wanted to ruin the prestige of these guys or i don't know it's just it's <laughs> interesting that this one of the greatest shoot things that ever happened uh, what if that one was a work it'd be i could see it it's interesting because the o- what the only the only backlash was that Triple H, who was a, a bottom of the card heel, got lost a bunch of times. Oh, the, like the only the only thing that was taken away quote from Triple H for that scenario because he was the only one they could punish was he didn't win the King of the Ring that year, you know, and the guy whose storyline was gonna win it anyway and probably should have Stone Cold Steve Austin did. Like it just it's just it, it seems it seems very plausible to me that it was a allowed thing that was a worked scenario. I don't know. I'm gonna look into that one. That's a that one that's pretty interesting. Alright, now this is one that I did not know people thought was real until uh because this person has been in the news a lot more lately. Uh, so I, I'm expecting that everyone else here is going to be like, oh no, that was absolutely, you know, that was a work that's silly, but there is, there are thousands of people that believe the, uh, Floyd money Mayweather going out and breaking the big show's nose, um, at no way out, whatever, 2005, I believe, um, was a, uh, no, not 2005, 2006 was a, uh, was a, uh, a shoot that he was not supposed to go out there and attack the big show and bust open his nose and make him bleed. I mean, from from everything I've heard, the segment was planned and breaking his nose was 
uh, was not. You, they didn't plan for his nose to get busted. Okay. Well, so I uh, guess I guess I sit somewhere in the middle. That 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 leads into the, that's the same general view I've got as if the 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 Hogan uh, two thousand thing. I think it was a, a work that people got a bit carried away about, <laughs> kind of lost themselves in the moment slightly. Yeah, because when Big Show talks about it, he talks about how, yeah, it was always supposed to happen. He was supposed to come out and punch me a couple times, but he punched me like five times in two seconds, and I didn't expect it, and I wasn't able to prepare myself, and I got my nose busted because Floyd just hit so hard. So, you know, it it, it feels like somewhere in the middle. Like, they didn't he didn't plan on breaking his nose, but he planned on hitting him. In an interview last year with The Sun, The Big Show officially says that he told Floyd Mayweather to break his nose oh, that all he asks is don't shove my nose through the back of my head don't break your fist or hurt yourself but you need to break my nose is the exact quote that the big show cool. that the big show says that he told Floyd so cool. that uh, that reminds me of uh, of uh, Kevin Owens NXT debut where CJ Parker gives him the super stiff palm strike to the nose and breaks Kevin Owens nose. That reminds me of that. I want to, that's a, that's the thing that I know that we've talked about in my household, whether or not that was uh, uh, a mistake by Parker or if it was a plan to, to have him g- get his nose busted, to make him look badass. I, I couldn't help but laugh there. I'm just looking up the post curtain call and Triple H lost, because he was getting punished at the time, he lost to Jake Roberts, Mark Merrill, Ahmed Johnson, Owen Hart, Sid Savio Vega, Yokozuna, Barry Windham, and Freddie Joy Floyd, but he got a pinfall victory over Bradshaw. <laughs> at least Bradshaw good, lost. Good for him. <laughs> uh, that's interesting, that's cool, I never, because uh, uh, it's a new interview, I never heard, that's cool that uh, that big show... Has uh, has uh, just legit come out and say that because I I always thought Big Show was badass and say telling him hey come break my nose that's pretty badass yeah I, I'm not sure what Mayweather's side of the story is that is not something that I've looked up because I really don't like interviews with him and reading them but <laughs> well, that's because Mayweather stays harder to kayfabe than anyone else in the world <laughs> I was gonna ask if you guys had any others I, I've got a, a a short daft one and one which. Nobody has admitted to not being a shoot, which I think is a work. Uh, so I'll just... The wee daft one, first of all, which I just thought specifically Jess will like, is that I think all the citizens are actually deliberate, which I mean is the quotes that Sid always comes up with that make him sound really daft and stupid. I think, he, like, you know, I have half the brain you do, we're live, pal, I don't know shit. I think he deliberately does them to to, to do his character, and everyone who goes, haha, what a daft idiot he is, is actually being um, marked, shall we say. I totally buy it. Sid has given a billion promos. Everybody gave a bunch of promos. And you know what he didn't screw up? Most of them. He screwed up like three. Uh, uh, I, I always, I always took it as a, uh, I always took it as a. Um, he was, he was working the boys. He was trying to make the guys backstage laugh because he's, su- he's such a company guy. He's yeah. such a guy that everybody loves working with, except for Arn Anderson apparently. But <laughs> he's such a guy that everybody likes working with that I thought he did it as a joke. And then Kevin Nash was just being an asshole and made fun of it, making it open uh, um, during their feud because Nash wants to look cool. But, um, yeah, the the one that I think is a work that everyone involved claims is shoot. No, it's not Montreal. <laughs> it is the Hell in a Cell at King of the Ring 1998. Or to be more precisely, the moment where Mick Foley goes through the top of the cell and hits the mat. Now, the official storyline, which is in his book... It's what Terry Funk says, it's what everyone involved in this match will tell you, is that uh, Foley was just meant to take a choke slam on top of the cell, but it broke and he went through. Now, what I think is that he was actually meant to go through the cell exactly as was seen, but uh, they hadn't foreseen how the landing would go, and of course they forgot there would be a bloody steel chair, which hit him right in the head from 
the velocity which made him far more injured than he had hoped. Uh, my evidence for this, uh, well, first of all, if he was taking a choke slam legit on top of the cell, he Mike Foley he keeps both him and Taker both keep their feet pretty much on the ground for this move and all of their movements around the cell uh, it's like you know they, they know part of it is loose so they are they, you know it's, it's like the, 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 the actor uh, who's flinching before the explosion happens because he knows it's going to come they, 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 are, they are behaving like they know there is a loose panel that they are yeah totally um, if I remember correctly they don't even step on the panel when they're no. up there they actively uh, step around it uh, and, and and Terry Funk comes out and takes a choke slam, and you know if it had legit happened, there is no way Terry Funk is keeping into a kayfab thing when the match might be over because his best pal is you know, you know he clearly he's in on it. Um, but the, the most uh, the the most uh, smoking gun thing for me is a storyline. If that wasn't going to happen, where the hell does the match go from there? They both climb back up to the top of the cage. They are battling. What do they then just climb back down and go into the into the ring? Well, I don't know. Can you not pin somebody on top of the cell? In the video games, you can. In, in the uh, first, that was the the second cell ever. Third cell. Uh, so I think they hadn't established that rule. That, that wasn't until two thousand and two, long after Foley had retired. Okay. Yeah. Triple H did it to Jericho, and it was a really stupid event back then too. <laughs> uh, I always thought I always thought that that was a work myself. I always thought uh, I never thought that was shoot. Yeah, personally. but it's interesting because even now, tw- uh, nearly twenty years later, no one has admitted that it was deliberate, and that's probably because they're all terrified of Foley's wife. Oh I'm yeah. Sure- I'm pretty sure that's one of the main reasons why they've kept it as a as, as a oh it was a shoot because if she found out that he had planned it you know basically wouldn't be around anymore. Yeah, <laughs> it, 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 it more than likely comes down to they left the chair in the wrong spot by accident. Yeah, yeah, that's a um, good one. Uh, I I only have two more. Uh, I have another daft one, as Michael said. And a and one that neither of these have a lot of conversation. They're just thought pieces. Like, uh, what if the plane ride from hell was a work? Oh, yeah. I think what I'm if on, it, I'm what on if board it was with that. Legitimately, what if it was legitimately just to make Brock Lesnar look like a badass? You know, it was just to add to his mystique. Kurt, Kurt Henning was already, maybe he had already failed a uh, wellness thing and he was already on his way out, so they came up with the story they, to work the audience. I don't know. It, it's interesting. That, that's, a, that's a tough one because considering how much traveling they do, I could totally see them just having plane rides from hell every now and then, but that one is pretty blown out of... I mean, it's pretty it's pretty wacky even for... Yeah. It's just interesting. It's a thing that I could see having actually been a work, but now that Kurt Henning is unfortunately dead, we will never get a full answer. So it's just interesting. I was so pissed off when he got fired for that. <laughs> yeah, Especially and when... wouldn't it be nice if it was a work that he wasn't fired for that? He was always His contract was up. He was always going to be fired. So they just had him go out on an interesting note. It'd be bittersweet either way, to be honest. The only other one I have is um, there's a a pretty famous uh, uh, ECW promo that Heyman gives where uh, Heyman shoots on TNA. Oh, yeah. um, uh, That most people think it's him shooting. But uh, uh, watching watching that promo in the storyline of ECW at that time, the storyline of ECW at that time was that TNA was the villain anyway. So it doesn't even come across that much as a shoot. Yes, Um, TNA, by the way. Oh, TNA, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I even have it written down the right way, just wrestling in the TN. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's, it's an interesting promo. People consider it that Heyman is shooting on the on the uh, channel. But it, uh, I don't know. It, it, to me, it comes across as storyline. It comes across as, uh, as a work. They already had What's-His-Face. Cyrus, I think his name was? Yeah. Yeah, they already had Cyrus as a character. They already, you know, it, it's interesting. Uh, um, I didn't put as much work into all of this as I normally do because it was just discussion topics. I just thought I'd bring some, bring it up. It's in- interesting. 
Yeah, I watched the Heyman promo that you're talking about because it's on the list of like, because I Googled what are the most crazy shoot moments in wrestling just to get some inspiration. And that was one of them. So I watched it, but not knowing all the other stuff going around at the time in ACW, it didn't really connect in any way. So. Yeah. I, I saw that, well, I didn't see it live because obviously it was on tape delay in, in Britain, but I saw it pretty much as live as you could get in the UK at the time. And I I was absolutely sort of gobsmack jaw hit the floor at the time. I thought it was entirely real, but then I was 14. Yeah, it, it comes across to me like the CM Punk pipe bomb, a thing that is supposed to elicit the idea that it's the shoot, but it had time planned for it and... Uh, uh, and you know he was uh, the creative let him talk about whatever he wanted to talk about it's that kind of thing I don't know uh, a few weeks uh, yeah because a few weeks later they had the, the 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 epic moment where Kid Cash won the TV title back off the network when everyone they screwed over came back at once to haunt them and if Lenny and other people haven't seen that, they need to watch this segment on YouTube because it is incredible how apeshit everyone, the, the crowd go when they realise that everything is coming back to the network. Oh yeah, absolutely. It is, it is, the, EC, it is the, 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 the best moment ECW had in their dying year, basically, in my... Uh, my next one is inspired by the CM Punk pipe bomb, so I'm glad you brought that up. But it's not about the CM Punk pipe bomb. Uh, but l- yes, everyone, the CM Punk pipe bomb was a promo that had a script. We talked about that here before. CM Punk has said it. It is this, get out of that uh that past that you've stuck yourself in. Um, but it my problem and the thing that I believe is not true, uh, is the entire storyline involving CM Punk from the pipe bomb to Money in the Bank, is that he has not signed a contract with WWE, um, but he's going to go into this Money in the Bank pay-per-view match, and if he wins it, he might be leaving. And the whole story is that he doesn't even sign the uh, contract to stay with the company until the night of the Money in the Bank pay-per-view. And I don't buy any of that at all. I think the moment that CM Punk is put in that match at Money in the Bank, and he has given the pipe bomb script, I think before that stuff even happens on TV, CM Punk has already signed his contract. He is already planning on staying. It is all just drama, and it's the lights, and it's the glimmer that they all put together, because that's what the whole entire storyline is for CM Punk at this time, is that he might not be staying around. And that's what the whole the whole appeal is, is that he's going to go into his hometown, win the belt, and leave WWE. And you don't you don't do all that if it's actually possible that he's going to be not not signing with the company. And I actually looked up articles about it back in 2011. I went way back into Google, and there are so many, so many different reports on what's going on by the dirt sheets of, oh, well, he signed an extension through this amount of time. Oh, no, he didn't actually sign extension. He's actually working for WWE unsigned for a couple of days. And, oh, well, there's like four different reports floating around the different ways that CM Punk has signed different contract and extensions and what he has and has not done during the month this month long feud of whether or not CM Punk has signed to the WWE and it was this huge deal everybody was covering it ESPN was covering it and I think it was all bull crap I think CM Punk was signed to a con and a lot of this might just be because CM Punk makes me so mad now but I think CM Punk was signed to a contract and he was safely in WWE and Vince had his had everything set up perfectly and safe during all these this crazy shoot stuff about CM Punk uh, yeah no I'm with you uh, Vincent Mann lived through the Montreal screw job, which some people think might be a work, but it's pretty impossible for that to be the case nowadays. But, you know, I'll mention it. We've mentioned it. But Vince lived through that. There's no way he's going to let that happen again. Vince is too smart. Yep. Yeah, no, I'm completely with you. Uh, and then my last one is one that um, I know of one person that I'm about to talk to that... Uh, uh, believes in this one, and there are a bunch of other people. Uh, this is the Royal Rumble 2005 that um, John Cena and Batista botched the ending of the Royal Rumble match and both fall out at the same time and land on the mat, and that that's not supposed to happen. 
Oh, interesting. Uh, I don't agree that that's not supposed to happen. I believe that that was the plan all along. Um, several reasons I believe that. Uh, both men were being pushed to the moon. They were going to receive huge pushes the last of the whole year, having them both win the Royal Rumble. That accomplishes that. Um, the referees immediately react, saying both men won. And, of course, they do it the right way, where the Raw ref is saying it for the Raw guy. SmackDown ref is saying it for the SmackDown guy. Um, they get in the ring, and they do their little thing where they're throwing each other over the top rope before Vince McMahon comes and restarts the match. Now, it is possible, and it makes sense that if you have a plan of if you both fall out, here's the here's what you need to do just in case that happens. So it's it's possible that, that they were all just following it perfectly, the emergency backup plan. But I think that that was the plan all along. When they're falling to the outside, they, they don't make any effort to try and keep themselves from falling. Cena kind of reaches out. But Cena is incredibly strong. I think Cena could have grabbed a rope or Batista, who also is incredibly strong, could have grabbed a rope and kept himself from falling. Uh, I think the reason this rumor has life is because... Vince McMahon, as we all know, runs out to uh, officially restart the match and tears both his squads. Now, if he's doing this because of a storyline he was supposed to come out, uh, this makes it look like he's an old man who doesn't know how to walk. If Vince McMahon is doing this because he is furious and he has to correct this big mistake, that these guys both fucked up, it doesn't look so bad. It looks like Vince had to run out there and he had to do this and he got hurt trying to fix everyone else's mistakes. So I think the WWE loves this rumor because it makes Vince not look like such an old man. It makes it look like he got hurt trying to fix things. But I think uh, that that's exactly how it was supposed to go, except for Vince McMahon tearing his quads. But besides that, I think all of it was exactly uh, planned and went accordingly. Uh, I don't know about Michael, but I know I know I, know I definitely think it was shoot. Just uh, every time I watch it, it feel it definitely feels like a botch. It looks like a botch. It feels like a botch. Vince comes out furious. Uh, 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 Occam's razor leads me to think that it was it was an accident. And then because uh, I uh, uh, I haven't watched it in a while, and I'm sure you watched it recently, so I'll rewatch it. But uh, it never felt immediate reactions to me. It it always it felt like. There was a uh, there was a moment of hesitancy with silent with silent commentary and so on and so forth. And I, uh, like I said, you've watched it more recently than I have, I'm sure. So I'll go, I'm going to go back and watch it now. But it, it always came across as a as an accident to me that they then fixed, uh, especially because uh, if they were going to do the um, if they were doing the um, the uh, the two man over thing, the repeat of '94. I don't know where I'm going with this. <laughs> I forget where I was going. I was going somewhere, but it doesn't matter. Uh, Michael, uh, where do you stand? It, it, it's a shoot. Sorry. Um, it's a very... It's a... Serendipitously, it looks like they were going for the two-person one. But uh, if I recall... I can't remind if, if you actually do see Batista trying to grab the rope and to go down... Uh, uh, the two things that really jump out at being a shoot is that A, if it had been a shoot, they wouldn't have left it at all, so they had three seconds left of pay-per-view time booked when uh, Batista officially wins the, the redo at the end. That's uh, They're clearly rushing to the finish. Uh, and two, um, Vince had done that into the ring many times and the reason he did his quads this time is because he rushed out without having uh, sort of warmed up shall we say for the, the power walk the Vince power walk and if they had been intending to do a scurry finish he uh, you know he, he would have been warmed up and ready to do his whole Vince thing so yeah I think it's a screw up that they covered remarkably well it's interesting. I really want to watch it again since you brought it up, Lenny, because uh, we're torn, you know? We're, we're, uh, broken table commentary does not agree. It's very interesting I, to me. I think the the way they fall out, I think it's supposed to be he lifts them up for the Batista bomb, and they fall out more to their side because the way they fall out, Batista can't see anything. So I think they got lucky in the way that they landed perfectly. But it's from the moment on that they land perfectly, and it is the fact that they're both the guys that they're pushing to the freaking moon. 
and it's the fact that everybody responds. It, it, but like I said when I was doing it, if they have a plan in place, which they probably do for if something like that happens, and everybody was so prepared for it, then they did a fantastic job covering it all up and making it seem like that it was all planned because everybody was on the ball. They made it seem like, to me, I they made it seem like it is absolutely planned whatsoever. But the the point about Vince McMahon having done it a thousand times and not hurting his squads, it, it, it is a good point. That is a good point. You even brought it up yourself. So, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, does that cover all of our uh, discussion? That is Everybody all I've got. Points? Cool. Well, then let's uh, let's uh, move on to topic three. Three. Now, a thing that was always a part of me wanting to do this podcast was I always wanted to have us have our legitimate Hall of Fame. I created the little Hall of Fame game that we did in episode two. It's now episode fourteen. It's three months since the last one. Uh, and I think it's a good time to do another one. Um, uh, any one of the three of us can bring up Hall of Fames. I'm just the one to have done it again. Uh, uh, but this time, the restrictions were they have to be women, uh, and they have to be retired, which means that they they have to be retired and or dead. They cannot have worked a match in the past uh, 365 days. Um, um, now, how this works is each of us bring three women... Uh, three candidates, three nominees to uh, to uh, be discussed upon, and then if all three of us have one shared, that person is automatically in. They are our headliner. If no one is shared between us, then we then have a, a discussion where, uh, for my picks, Lenny and Michael will pick one of them. For Michael, Lenny and I will pick his, and for Lenny, Michael and I will pick his. So we will potentially have three. If for some reason we have all three, all of us have the exact same three, then all three would go in. There's no discussion. That won't happen, but it could. Um, if two of them, then those two go in, and that's the end. Um, because the Hall of Fame is supposed to be prestigious and rare, so that's what we're going to do. So this is all women. Uh, and uh, we're working a little bit different format, try to get away from monologuing, because last time I spent seven minutes talking about Lex Luger, and Michael spent like five minutes talking about Owen. So, I mean, uh, we, we, we both are a little long-winded. So we're, we're going to have a little bit more discussion. So you're not allowed to back up your... You're not allowed to make a case for your nominees at all. The other people are allowed to ask you any questions, and then you can make a case based on their questions. Uh, everyone with me? Yeah. All right, uh, um, I'll go ahead and say my three since I'm already talking. My three nominees are Alundra Blaze, Miss Elizabeth, and Sarah Del Rey. Okay, uh, I have May Young, Trish Stratus, and Miss Elizabeth. I have three, and they are China, Rita, and May Young. Ooh. Weevil. No, uh, no crossover. Well, there we go. We have I have them written down. So, uh, um, uh, who 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 do you guys want to go first? Who do you want to uh, uh, be the first one we we pick from? Well, I don't know. You understand? Well, here, let's let's you, go ahead and. I'm sorry. I was gonna say you understand how this works better than me and Michael. I think so. You should uh, figure out who should be going first. Sure, sure. Let's do. Let's save Michael some voice, and we'll we'll do Michael's first. So, Michael, uh, your three were China, Lita, and May Young. So now, Lenny, you and I can ask him any questions we want to know about those three. Uh, but it'll be up to us to pick together one of those three women to be uh, in the Hall of Fame. Okay, my first question is uh, why Lita over Trish Stratus? Because. Rita was infinitely preferable to Trish Stratus. Also, uh, if you take my bias out of the way there, you can't have... Well, you could have a Trish Stratus, but she was dependent on the path that had been laid out by Lita and Ivory, but mostly Lita, over the previous uh, year and a half to two years prior before they actually gave Trish her uh, push into... You know, the, the acceptable women wrestling, uh, as as opposed to just the uh, valet figure. Um, 
plus essentially you you needed a Lita figure for a Tristratus to be able to be what she was. Uh, L- Lenny nominated Mae Young, but I'm interested in why you nominated Mae Young. Because I think she's awesome. <laughs> uh, I uh, agree with that. I mean, uh, well, clearly, but you know, <laughs> I didn't nominate her, so that's, that's I wanted. Why I wanted to hear? We're talking about a woman who had a 71 year wrestling career. Um, who uh, Lou Fez, when he was asked in 2001 to name the five legit toughest people he ever knew in wrestling, he named me young on that list, and he didn't like women's wrestling, so that tells you what her reputation was like. Um, you know, we're talking about someone who, you know, back in the 40s got arrested for kicking someone who made improper advances to a wrestling show so bad he broke his back to 57 odd years later uh, nearly 80 years old she fre- she threatens Bubba Ray Dudley that if he doesn't legit go through with a power bomb off the ramp through a table to an 80 year old the 80 year old will kick his ass and he is legit feared of Mae Young you know I'll ask, we don't actually have her her greatest stuff uh, recorded at all because it's all way before recording uh, TV and shit uh, TV in general but you know she's a proper legend uh, uh, do you have any other questions I, I don't actually don't have any other questions um, I know we haven't <laughs> talked about China but uh, but uh, I, I get why China's on this list so I totally get it uh, uh, do you have any other questions for him Lenny no I, I, I really China was in my top five when I had to put together a top three so I have no I totally get China too. Yeah, so China, t- China is totally deserving. She was on my short list as well. I had a short list of five, and I had to leave two off, and yep. China was one of them. Um, um, so, um, uh, what do you think, Lenny? Um, I am, uh, I am leaning towards uh, uh, China because she's because uh, neither you or I mentioned her, but both both of us uh, uh, liked her. Um, uh, but I'm leaning towards China. Well, now uh, we get it three. into a weird thing because doesn't it make sense for me to pick Mae Young? I mean, that makes. Uh, I mean, <laughs> if you want to, because it's well, on... you can, we can we can game the system however you want. It's just you know. Um. Uh. Um. Uh. I. I yeah. Well, we'll go with China. Yeah, I, I think China is definitely deserving, uh, and I like it. And I also like Mae Young, you know. I I, I like both, uh, but w- with Michael only seeing China, I, I I really like China, so I think that's a good good call. Yeah, you go with that, Lenny. Yep. There you go. Official first one ends China. The one you didn't get to talk about is the one we're picking because we because we both already knew. Yeah. I heard her go up here with the other ones, and I was yeah. like, uh, she really deserves this because more than likely she'll never get in the WWE one, which is a shame. So. I, I hope I think she deserves to be here. Hey, this is Jessel. I'm doing this from editing. Uh, so I realized a flaw in my plan. We should be talking how amazing these women are. Uh, and in my haste to try to make us save a lot of time, because I felt like in the recording we were taking an enormous amount of time, and I had to cut a huge argument about money in the bank and me being a doofus, and just I had to cut so many things from earlier... But once I got to this point, I realized, oh, we have a whole crap load of time to talk about these women. And Lenny and I both legitimately didn't talk about China. It was since we didn't ask Michael to talk about it, this new format I was trying, which I don't I don't know if it worked. Let me know if you guys think it does. We didn't talk about China. So I'm going to talk about China real quick. China deserves to be in the Hall of Fame for one very important reason. She is the Divas Revolution. That Divas Revolution that, that we are so proud of, the women's wrestling coming back, yeah, China is is a is a intercontinental champion. At one point, she was even considered and booked to become the first and probably only female WWE champion of all time. She was a powerhouse. She uh, was part of DX, one of the most influential factions of all time, regardless of how I think about factions. That is just a true statement, and there's no way to argue it, argue against it, I should say. 
On top of all that, she put on pretty damn decent matches. She wasn't the greatest in the world, but she always had a mystique. She was the ninth wonder of the world. She was, uh, her, her work with Chris Jericho, her work with Jeff Jarrett, her work with Eddie Guerrero, all of that stuff just stands out head and shoulders above so much of the work at that time from other women. Because there's plenty of other women that worked in the company, but China was something special and unique. And on top of it, all three of us uh, personally believe, and I've said this earlier, but all of us, as uh, all of us are very incredibly saddened by her death and the unfortunate turn that her life took. And even worse, that the relationship statuses of people backstage ended up hurting her career, which sent her in a down spiral and just so much. So we we really want to honor her. And I think it is incredibly fitting for her, her to be in our Hall of Fame. I'm proud of it. I Like I said uh, before I had to do this edit... I, I honestly believe she really deserves to be in the WWE Hall of Fame. And if she gets there, good. She deserves it. But I wanted to let you all know uh, exactly why all three of us uh, love China, And uh, definitely check out some of her matches. Uh, as, as an Eddie Guerrero lover, as we, he's in our Hall of Fame too, it is, it is 100% necessary watching for you to see... Eddie Guerrero and China's story, the Mamacita story. It is wonderful. All right, guys. Uh, thanks for dealing with me doing this out of the regular time. Uh, let me get back to us uh, talking. Hopefully, I don't have to do this again for another person that we didn't actually talk about enough. But I think we should be fine. All right. I can go next. You guys can ask me questions. All right, um, uh, Lenny Zermay Young, Trish Stratus, and Miss Elizabeth. Miss Elizabeth. Uh, you have any questions for Lenton, Michael? Well, I, I can reverse his question to him and uh, why Trish and not Lita. <laughs> I, think it's a, I think that's a good choice. Yeah. Uh, um, Trish Stratus, for me, why I think she is such a huge success story and what I love so much about Trish Stratus is that she was brought into the WWE as uh, just a model, as just to be another, she was just going to be another pretty face. She was just going to be a, a manager character. She was going to be the girl that Vince was going to have bark and he was going to make out with to make Linda. I mean, and, and, and so many women would have been perfectly happy with that role. I mean, we've seen it happen a hundred times in wrestling where, I mean, she was in main events as a just a eye candy character. And that has been perfectly fine for so many other people. But for Trish Stratus, that was not enough. She didn't have a wrestling experience until she got around to the WWE. And she, she was told, hey, you don't really need to worry about that. You just be hot and you're going to be making a lot of money and you're going to be famous. But she was like, you know what? I want to be seven time women's champion. I want to be a hardcore champion. And she, she took off and she became so, so much more than what she was already so successful at being something else. She became a fantastic wrestler and she wasn't just happy being, uh, just the, the pretty hot. And she's very extremely hot. Don't get me wrong. Uh, the, the, that's why I put in here her in here instead of Lita. Lita's I, I like Lita. Don't get me wrong, but the fact that Trish Stratus had all this stuff handed to her and she could have easily just coasted by being just the pretty face character, but instead she ends up being s such a huge part in wrestling for women, a seven-time women's champion. Uh, that's why I have her over Lita. Uh, I, I have Miss Elizabeth on my list, obviously, but uh, I'm I'm. It was a thing I wrestled with, so I want to hear your thoughts. Uh, uh, do you? How do you feel about her? La the last years of her her career, uh, which are which are marred generally with which what most people consider to be terribleness. Uh, um, uh, does that phase you? Does that not? How does that affect your thoughts on her in the Hall of Fame? That doesn't phase me at all because here's the thing. There are wrestlers in the Hall of Fame that are men wrestlers that have done these exact same kind of things, and the only difference was they didn't die from it. 
because of the fact that it ended in a way that she died from doing these kinds of things, it, it makes it, it yeah, it makes it seem worse, and it's a lot more, and it adds an extra bit of dramaticness, uh, dramatics to it. But I mean, this is during a wrestling time when I mean people were doing crap like this constantly. There are so many stories about wrestlers that we know of. I mean, Stone Cold Steve Austin has beaten how many women? I mean, how many times has he had the police called on him for stuff? I mean, how many wrestlers do we know that have been arrested for drugs? And how many times has Scott Hall been had his mugshot taken at this point? There are, are this is all over the place in wrestling stuff like this, and it's and it's 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 sad that it ended the way it did for her. But you can't say that it gets taken away because it unfortunately ended with her dying when it doesn't get taken away for the people who were able to uh, survive it. So I don't think it takes away from her wrestling career. I think that's incredibly unfair. I, I agree. I just wanted to hear you say it. Yeah, uh, I mean... <laughs> sorry, go ahead. No, I'm just giggling. Oh, uh, I mean, uh, Mr. Perfect uh, died of a cocaine addiction. Um, and there's kind of rumblings about was it Nintendo D or not uh, and, uh, and the other flip of that is that when he was broken down through the addiction towards the end of his life you know, uh, uh, you know he has some really awful matches that are way below the standards he should have but that doesn't detract from you know everything he did at the peak uh, so I, I, I think all of us would be completely hypocrites if we then uh when, oh, this person was good at their peak, but they had personal demons uh, later on in their life. Uh, that should distract, because, you know, we are avoiding the personal demons from oh, hundreds of our favourites and all time, kinds of things on a daily basis. Yeah, no, I wasn't trying to imply I think she doesn't deserve it. I was just being a good straw man and asking the question. <laughs> no. uh, I, I think Chris Benoit deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. I mean, you know, I'm not... I definitely don't think uh, think that uh, anything she did should keep her out. Uh, just, you know, just, just, I was just asking the questions. No, that's a good question. Thank you. Uh, Michael, do you have any other questions you want to ask? How Wilson awesome was Mae Young? <laughs> I, you know, I haven't seen a lot of Mae Young because, like you mentioned earlier, a lot of it is really, really hard to come by. The main thing you got to take away from Mae Young is what wrestler doesn't say, a female wrestler, that they were inspired by Mae Young? You've got, like, every female that's ever wrestled that gives her credit for what they're doing now. And you can't ignore stuff like that. That's, like, a huge thing. And, like, when she passed, I, I was reading this stat – uh, the week that she passed, there were seven seven wrestling uh, organizations that did a tribute to her at the beginning of their show. So you had SmackDown and TNA, the on because the, they they had their shows on the same night at that point, and uh, they both opened the show with tributes to Mae Young with the, oh here's a minute of silence for Mae Young. I mean that's the that's the kind of influence she had. Uh, I heard I mean her list of accomplishments in WWE are trash, but. Uh, Miss Royal Rumble swimsuit contest to Royal Rumble 2000, and she won a Slammy for Knucklehead Moment of the Year. But uh, I mean, th the fact that those can be your two biggest accomplishments in WWE, and everybody considers you to be one of their biggest inspirations is is unreal. Like, yeah, we talked about it previously. The she's named for the classic and not Moolah. I think that's incredible for her. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Oh. It's great because essentially she she thought to she thought for the right to be a sex mad granny on TV. You know that was her feminism, and you know. Oh. So I'm guessing, Michael, when it comes down to you and me, that that you would you would throw your your weight behind Mae Young, considering you nominated her earlier. Yeah, I'm certainly tactically voting for Mae Young here. Sorry. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with it. Um, uh, um, uh, tactical votes are fine. Um, I, I'm perfectly fine with giving to Mae Young. I, I, I obviously, I think all three of my, my nominees deserve it. Uh, and this, this, you know, statistically makes it harder to get all of them in. But whatever. I think Mae Young totally deserves it. So I'm with you. I'll, 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 I'll go behind and have Mae Young be our second uh, Hall of Fame entry. Yeah. Get that China versus Mae Young match. 
Absolutely. All right, um, and now you guys can ask me whatever you want. My three nominees were Alundra Blaze, Miss Elizabeth, and Sarah Del Rey. All right, uh, um, um, run down Sarah Del Rey for everybody. Uh, uh, we, both as a podcast, but we as Americans and uh, UK chaps in general, tend to focus on, on uh, WWE, it's the largest company, um, but that is definitely ignoring a, lo- a large amount of modern day great wrestlers that happened that never got a chance in the WWE, and Sarah Del Rey is one. She was, uh, she was in the GLOW uh, revival as Sarah Death Ray, and she was awesome. She was the lead greatest character in Shimmer. And uh, 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 which was an incredible women's pr- uh, promotion where Beth Phoenix got her start, and so many other incredible women wrestled, uh, and they did it all just them, all women, and it was very very cool. She's a great wrestler, but all of that beside itself, the real reason why she is on my list for me is because she has since retiring from the ring has become the head trainer at NXT. Yeah, she is. She is the one who is. You you want you you like the Divas Revolution? You can thank Sarah Del Rey because she's the one who trained Charlotte, uh, Alexa Bliss, uh, Sasha Banks, Becky. She's the one that helped make them be the new mold of women in the WWE. She's she is the one who is um, and now she's not even just training the women. That was just when she was the 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 women's head coach. She's now the head coach of all of NXT. So uh, all these all these wrestlers that we're loving, that's making NXT so brilliant, uh, uh, all the ways that they are getting better. Roderick Strong improving from bland character of nothingness to actually having personality in telling stories in the ring. We can thank Sarah Del Rey for it. And I think that um, a lot of times uh, we tend to focus on... As as viewers, as fans, not the three of us, but viewers in general, we tend to focus on um, what what happened in the ring. And while Sarah Del Rey has an in the ring worth Hall of Fame career, what she did did out of the ring for wrestling currently is incredibly important, and that's why she that's why she eked out uh, China on my on my uh, my list. Yeah, I certainly don't know her in the ring stuff, but I have been following her as the uh, NXT goddess that she is. Yeah, definitely check out. See if you can't find some shimmer matches with her because she's she's very good. She's a very good wrestler. And Alundra Blaze, I'm trying to think of a good question just to sell me on her because I I've never been a fan. Um, uh, why? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I was trying to think of a better way. No, of I, I, under, I understand. Well, I mean, if for nothing else, she has the most iconic uh, females wrestling thing that ever happened in the Attitude Era, and that's throwing away the belt on Nitro. Yeah. Like, if nothing else, that's a Hall of Fame moment highlight. Period. That thing was an enormous moment. But on top of that, she had incredible matches with with. Um, um, uh, oh, now I can't remember her name. Uh, uh, big, big Japanese lady. He was such a destructive. Oh uh, yes, yeah. I know you're talking uh, about. I can't think. So of her many name great either. matches. Uh, she, uh, she was essentially female Hogan, um, uh, in the ring. She was the backbone of of female wrestling in the WWF during the new generation. Um, and then when she went to WCW, uh, they created a whole division around her and brought in people for her. Now, she wasn't treated great, mind you, but she is an inspiration for women. Just like Mae Young is an inspiration for women, in the exact same breath, most women wrestling now will then say Alundra Blaze. Because she uh, uh, she was beautiful, and she was always an athlete before she was beautiful, uh, which is incredible. Now, unfortunately, just like with Miss Elizabeth or some... A lot of other people. She had an unfortunate end to her career in WCW, um, uh, with all the garbage with Oklahoma and and all the shit that Russo made her do. But that doesn't take away from her her uh, quality of work and for being the top woman of that era of wrestling. There was no one who held a candle to her uh, at that point in time. Where did Miss Elizabeth rank for you in the sort of uh, realm of? Talk to your WWE manager slash valets and uh, Miss Elizabeth ranks for me as the most important woman in all of professional wrestling. Period. That, that's 
that's where she ranks for me. She's the most emotionally connected. She's the uh, one of the greatest managers of all time. If Miss, if look at the caliber of wrestler that has been attached to Miss Elizabeth in her career, it's Hogan, Savage, Luger, Sting, Flair. Five of the legitimate greatest wrestlers of all time all had Miss Elizabeth attached, and Miss Elizabeth was a large part of that. I think that uh, Elizabeth and Luger, despite the unfortunate death and the unfortunate manslaughter and so on, so on, so on, I think they worked amazingly together. The Mega Power storyline is one of the greatest storylines of all time. Ultimate Warrior versus Randy Savage uh, um, uh, is the greatest WrestleMania match, in my opinion, of all time. Greatest professional wrestling match of all time, in my opinion, because of Miss Elizabeth's involvement uh, uh, legitimate weeping tears from the audience, from men and women. Her death is one of the most tragic deaths of all time. So that's, you know, that's Miss Elizabeth ranks as the highest, period. There are other managers who who uh, were more manager-y. You know, they did more things. But, uh, but uh, Miss Elizabeth, for me, ranks as number one of all women, let alone managers. Cool. <laughs> Well, yeah, you, 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 you've convinced me there. I mean, in my three that I gave for my Hall of Fame, Elizabeth was number one out of my three, so I'm going on Miss Elizabeth out of out of Jessel's nominations, definitely. Yeah, I, mean, I like to sum up for the previous two, but now he's got me thinking of uh, the whole warrior... Uh, Savage WrestleMania 7 and how she's a big part of that and how can I vote against someone who's part of one of the greatest WrestleMania moments of all time on top of everything else so yeah Miss Elizabeth I, I certainly can't argue obviously mm-hmm. uh, and I, th- I think that I think that maybe a little controversial uh, for some of you listening but I think that our, our second ever Hall of Fame class has legitimately three of the greatest females in wrestling, not just wrestlers, just in wrestling, spanning an enormously amazing period of time with Mae Young, Miss Elizabeth, in China. I think that they are an excellent addition to the Broken Table Commentary Hall of Fame. Hooray. Round of applause for those ladies. I always love doing these Hall of Fames, and I uh, um, uh, I love being able to just... Uh, as much as a critic as I am, uh, um, uh, as Lenny points out, it's so wonderful to just talk about the positive things in wrestling. And uh, I opened this episode with being very cross and overly <laughs> emotional and cross about how Women's Money in the Bank went. But ending it like this is legitimately the best way I could think of to end a, a uh, episode uh, that focuses on ladies that focuses on the women of wrestling. Uh, And I'm very, very, very proud of the three of us as well, Uh, uh, just because I think that we work really hard to be inclusive, and I think we uh, created... If you don't know these three women, go look up as much as you can from them, because they are legitimately three of the greatest of all time. Now, be careful what you look up about China, though. I mean, some people might want to see the porn... I didn't say, I just meant be prepared. I guess that's what I should have said. Yeah, uh, uh, always use the word wrestling when you search <laughs> as well. I like porn, I mean. <laughs> I think on that note, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's, it's time to say goodbye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.